Uh, yeah, so thank you, Philip, for inviting me here and thank you for the introduction. And uh, it's great to follow after Revital and Revital Tura. Really exciting artist whose work I've been following a long time since we both come from the Royal College of Arts. It's a bit of a reunion going on today. Um, and some of you probably, uh, if you know my work, a lot of it is actually more along this line. It's it's based on uh, a lot of my early work was based on exploring 3D printing and uh, creating my own so software, um, working with 3D scans and remixing those scans with my own uh, software scripts that I was making and 3D printing derivatives of objects I'd scanned. Um, so a lot of that work involved uh, looking at questions of authorship and how far you needed to sort of manipulate an object before it became kind of uh, a legally viable uh, remix of an object. And, and uh, Philips uh, used an image of my work, which I've just kind of put in this collage on the right, which is actually a collaboration that I did with Jody, uh, which are uh, uh, pioneers of net art. And again, it was still kind of following this lineage of finding objects online and doing these remixes. Uh, but I'm not going to talk too much about that today because I've just come out of my PhD. So <laughs> I'm going to try not to make it a typical talk that happens after your PhD where you just talk about theory all the time. But there will be some theory. Uh, so I want to talk about Algopop, which is this blog that I started in 2012. Uh, and Algopop was, um, I guess it satisfied a need for me. Uh, I was looking for just a blog that was documenting all these interesting moments in which people uh, were encountering uh, software automation through apps or online services and all the kind of strange anomalies that, that would uh, occur from uh, these, th these kind of entanglements and these tensions. Uh, so I'd find things like this, which is uh, someone's... Uh, now also, just the meta-narrative, now that uh, there's so much fake news, I think I'm probably a victim of a lot of fake news and I don't know if this is true. So, um, But this is one where someone's left their trombone um, playing over a voice recognition communications and it's just sort of uh, sent all these text messages. Uh, this one I do know for sure that it's true. Uh, uh, the um, so there's a police investigation into murder, and then when they checked the, the, the phone records, it turned out that that person had used Siri to find a suitable place for hiding the, hiding the body, and Siri actually gave some, some, some suggestions. Uh, <clears throat> and this is just kind of also, I document a lot of strange things that pop up in Facebook. Facebook seems to be the gold mine for this kind of thing. Um, so I guess uh, my PhD was a bit of like, in general, it was looking at a lot of art practices, including my own art practice, but it was also about trying to find what was the conceptual framework that really worked for me in terms of understanding uh, what is going on here. And, and not so much trying to explain it and, and find some sort of rational understanding of it, but just finding sort of new readings of, of, of these situations. Um, so I was obviously looking at... Uh, there's so many different systems for studying this and different uh, viewpoints. And I think uh, I, I obviously got a little bit obsessed for, for a period of time with critical algorithm studies, which is a whole body of literature, uh, which actually doesn't work for me because it's a body of literature that essentializes the algorithm. It looks for an algorithm as a way to explain all this. And and a lot of the arguments come back saying, well, if only we could look at the algorithm, then we'd be able to actually explain it. But it happens to be that this algorithm is in a black box and is proprietary, so we can't see it, so we can't tell you what the algorithm is, but we're sure it's the algorithm. Um, so I, I actually kind of moved away from that more into science and technology studies and feminist studies. Um, so I was really... Um, excited about new developments from writers like uh, Lucy Sushman and Karen Barad um, and even Donna Haraway, who kind of looked at this uh, from a very different perspective, uh, looked more at, at that sort of social activity and that sort of human entanglement. And, and, and that was really, really fascinating, a different way of moving away from the algorithm as the core 
uh, technology or the essence of these situations. And also I got really excited about software architecture and software architecture is this kind of really um, dry um, kind of field within computer science, uh, which was really set up to um, conceptualize very complex software networks. Uh, but it, it was also kind of empirically uh, enacted in, in software systems. So I'll explain a little bit in a moment. So one of the strands of my studies is called multiplicity. Uh, and a mu multiplicity is a term borrowed from, from Deleuze. And, and it kind of applies very well to architect uh, software architecture configuration. So uh, Roy Fielding is, um, he, he, he did this, uh, he's kind of one of the, the main architects of software architecture. And he also worked for the World Wide Web Consortium. So a lot of his ideas he actually implemented in the standards and the protocols of the web itself. And so he's the kind of modern architect of, of Web 2.0. And he, he, I mean, this sounds really dry, but it's kind of very insightful that a software architecture is defined by a configuration of architectural ele elements, components, connectors, and data constrained in their relationships in order to achieve a desired set of architectural properties. Um, so really, he, uh, he kind of moved away from the web being these kind of standalone websites to these kind of interconnected elements. This is one of his diagrams. And his diagrams are really actually not quite easy to explain. Um, but the important bit here is, is actually this idea of code on demand. So when you visit a website, it's actually visiting lots of other components in real time and, and, and kind of so sourcing uh, different bits of code from different websites that are encap encapsulated and they're communicating to each other using uh, application programming interface, an API. And this was very much Fielding's idea for how the web should be reshaped. Um, and, um, and, 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 and these ideas really took off. You know, the, the whole uh, social media platform is, is sort of based on this type of architecture. Um, but it's also the architecture, I mean, through, through this lens of, of software architecture, we can understand a lot of things. So chatbots, for instance, essentially is a very kind of small type of computer architecture, uh, one that sort of interfaces with a bigger platform uh, and has its own sort of database. And, and this is a chatbot designed by uh, Michael Molden, who, whose bot Julia uh, roamed um, a tiny mud, uh, which is pre-web. And uh, he actually became a multimillionaire because Julia evolved into a spider web that would um, catalog the early World Wide Web, and that was called Lycos. And, and Lycos back then was one of the big main search engines. Uh, so the interesting thing about Fielding's ideas is that they can kind of scale up. That, that I mean, this whole premise of architecture was that it could multiply. Um, and, and this is a um, computer architecture diagram for Storyblocks, which is a platform that I had never heard of. But I found it really insightful to see um, <clears throat> a platform show a graphic of just how complex a platform is. This is a platform designed to give you uh, recommendations for, for photographs and also for photographers to upload their images into this sort of database. Uh, so it's kind of like a more commercialized Flickr. Um, and it's really interesting to see that there is no singular algorithm Instead, code is enca encapsulated into lots and lots of different components. Uh, so, so a database software would be written by database software engineers, and they would wrap that up in a way that they can, could speak to uh, uh, a server. And then you have other servers running other routine things like doing sort of image tagging. And all this stuff is, is all sort of... Um, uh, what, what it does is all these kind of interrelated parts uh, creates these kind of new agencies, these new capacities and, and these new um, generative outputs to these systems. And, and it's a system like this that would then give you an anomaly like this. Uh, so where your recommendation for having seen a bug's life would be you'll love the human centipedes. And so this is not the result of any singular sort of algorithm or script. This is the, the, the strange anomaly of, 
uh, all those different components coming together. There's the things that go into the database, there's the way that the database operates, there's the way that, um, I guess, your own user activity triggers other things. A way another script, for instance, will find the connection between the word bug and the word centipede. Um, here's another anomaly where I guess there's so much information in Google's uh, Google Translate system that if you put in sort of uh, the repeated uh, interesting characters, you'll get this kind of strange uh, poetry. Uh, or also like a situation here where, uh, um, again, a Facebook anomaly where if you're called grandma, you might be auto-completed as Grandmaster Flash. Um, and, and this brings up uh, like kind of another component to my research was actually how humans and social activity is entangled in these systems. Um, and, and, and new ideas come in from writers like Karen Barad really helped me sort of reshape my thinking uh, because I guess I was working in, um, in an interaction research studio and the word interaction really sort of frames it in, in such a way that we think of uh, this kind of dichotomy between humans and non-humans that we're kind of, I mean, th this kind of project is my pet peeve. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I know, Philip, you probably have a lot of this on can, uh, but it's really interaction kind of um, sets up this, this, this dichotomy between the, the, the human user and the sort of machine, and those two things are kind of separate components and that they meet at this interface at this point of interaction. Uh, and obviously interaction doesn't totally cover that, but in, in a nutshell, this is kind of sometimes how it uh, configures this understanding. Uh, whereas what I was interested in, in this other notion of interaction, uh, how entanglement is a whole gamut of different types of uh, connections with social activities that are both interaction and interaction. Uh, for instance, uh, you might've come across uh, capture that will help you, uh, for instance, this, 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 this Google technology wants uh, you to help it train it to recognize the difference between Zizek and Mark Hamill, um, who plays Luke Skywalker. Um, and uh, I, uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Thompson, is doing this whole study around the, the computers used by uh, Mechanical Turkers. So, Mechanical Turk is a whole um, system operated by Amazon um, where, where they sort of outsource elements of human computation to humans uh, rather than... So it's kind of like doing the same sort of architecture but enca encapsulating human activity as a component that you can append onto your own architectural configurations. Um, and it's interesting how uh these 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 systems have scaled up i mean this this is kind of like a 看我的视频没有点赞就离开了可有些人还没看完随手就是一个赞因为他们知道每个人都不容易随手一个赞就是对年轻人最大的鼓励如果你也是 um, interesting this has some uh, overlaps with some of your work Revital, where there's there's the, this kind of behind the technological system you have uh, these kind of embedded um, human workers and, and, and social activity that is kind of hidden from view specifically to give you this illusion of this kind of human machine relation, but actually that, that, that machinic system relies on all these uh, human actors as well. So going into theory again, Karen Barad's quote here is the neologism inter interaction signifies the mutual constitution of entangled agencies. That is in contrast to the usual interaction, which assumes that there are separate individual agencies that precede their interaction. The notion of interaction recognizes that distinct agencies do not proceed, but rather emerge through that, their interaction. And that is from the book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, Quantum Physics and the Entanglement of Matter and Meaning. Uh, but but I, I, I don't wanna just kind of paint this picture that this interaction is always uh, sort of negative and hidden from view. There was this uh, wonderful project, which was an April Fool's Day project by Reddit, uh, where they created this canvas and different subreddit communities were competing to, um, to take over parts of that canvas. They could only paint one pixel at a time, but they were all kind of competing to mark out their territory 
on this canvas. So there was this kind of um, emergent uh, painting uh, over the course of a day. And on the internet, you can kind of find live videos of this. And it's actually quite incredible how the, all these kind of humans are entangled in the system, uh, painting away uh, different components of the picture. Uh, and another project I really admired by uh, Ranjit uh, Bhatnaga is Pentametron, which is a bot that simply retweeted um, any tweets that it would find that were in this kind of iambic pentameter, pentameter structure and rhyming. Um, so all these people are sort of complicit in this, this ongoing poem without realizing it. Um, and the, then the sort of third pillar of my analysis uh, is this notion of figuration, uh, which originates from Haraway, but it's really sort of taken on by Lucy Sushman. And it's really about how then we char characterize uh, those systems, but also how characterizations of a system uh, then inform how we develop technology. Uh, so Alexa is a really good example of how ingrained certain ideas are in, in, in how we figure and how we uh, characterize a very complex system. So Alexa is following this tradition of, of, of being this kind of um, domestic worker that, that is somehow automated uh, and obviously very much engendered. And um, there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of problems with this. I mean, one, one is that it says, just ask Alexa to control your smart home without lifting a finger. Um, but obviously, that doesn't take into account the kettle might not have any water in it, at which point you might as well turn the kettle on yourself. Um, but I find it really interesting having to trace back the root of this narrative. It goes all the way back to where the word robot comes from. The word robot comes from Carol Capek's 1920s uh, theater production uh, about factory made laborers. And it was about these. So these aren't supposed to be mechanical beings. They're sort of... Uh, uh, flesh and blood beings like us, but they were sort of made in a factory, and 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 the word roboti or robota is is a Czech word for slave laborer, um, and somehow this 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 play was 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 quite popular. It toured the U.S. Um, and 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 coming from from you know sort of 19, 1990s, it was really like a reflection on the rise of. Uh, populism and socialism and how potentially the working class could uh, under strain revolts and, and overthrow the elites, which is what happens in the story. Um, but of course, um, th this term robot gets picked up by Asimov and he coins robotics and the whole field right from the beginning instills this idea that robots are there to obey us and be our servants. Uh, the second law of robotics is a robot must obey orders given to by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law, which is about uh, protecting humans. Um, and then the, you know, the, this, this, this kind of, uh, this narrative gets ingrained and sort of reenacted again and again in popular culture. Um, so a lot of the technologies that we end up developing then in turn uh, tried to materialize these narratives. Uh, Lucy Sushman's quote here again, initiatives and new technology materialize the cultural imaginaries that inspire them and which they turn, work in turn to enact. The effects of figurations are political in the sense that the specific discourses, images, and normativities that inform practices of figuration can work either to reinscribe existing social order orderings or to challenge them. Uh, and this last part about challenging um, those, those kind of ingrained figurations is kind of where I see this framework being really useful for practice, um, which I'll come back to later. Um, I've recently moved to Mac and I've discovered Cortana, which is the inbuilt AI, the chatbot. And if you, uh, um, Cortana is actually, um, is quite a sort of a nuisance software. It sort of props up a lot unless you actually disable it. Uh, it's also built into Sky, uh, into Skype. And what I found really uh, fascinating was actually Cortana uh, comes from the game Halo. So Microsoft also owned this game called Halo. And 
And in the game, it's characterized as this female assistant. Um, and it was uh, voiced by a voice actor called Jen Taylor. And um, when they decided to sort of build uh, the, the sort of real chatbot for Microsoft, they decided to keep the name Cortana and even keep Jen Taylor as the voice actor. So this, this, this whole idea, this imaginary uh, assistant really becomes sort of materialized in, in, in the sort of architecture of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And the lead developer of Microsoft says, one of the Cortanas is an intelligent learning AI who is duty bound to help a companion as much as possible using a staggering database of information combined with real growing knowledge of that companion. And the other Cortana, well, is the same thing. Um, but it's, it's not just technology companies that sort of peddle these narratives and reinforce them. It's also uh, very much the press. And, and, and from my own um, experience of having work in the press, it's really uh, incredible how often uh, they distort my work to fit the, these narratives to talk about sort of robots taking over the world. Um, and also marketing departments really create uh, kind of these kind of mythological narratives. Uh, this is this like kind of terrible marketing campaign for ask.com, uh, which they had just had a software upgrade. And so the marketing team, um, well, the sort of advertisers came up with this brilliant idea where they would kind of generate this, 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 this whole mythological character called the algorithm. And the algorithm was meant to do all these things like find Jesus because so many people would search for Jesus on the search engine um, and so on. Um, but it's interesting because here the, 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 this notion of an algorithm stops becoming this kind of technical term and becomes more of a, a type of figuration for computer architecture. Um, so it's often we find software figures, algorithms, apps, machines, bots, AI, and, and they carry uh, tropes of being servants, assistants, human-likes, uh, either being smart or intelligent, and increasingly being, because of machine learning, we kind of conceive them as being kind of childlike and, and ongoing a learning process. Um, so I, I find it kind of very useful to have this framework because it gives us a reading in which we can kind of start thinking of these things as creative practice. And I curated a show as part of my research called Art of Bots. And I brought together all these um, artists and, and technologists that were kind of really pushing the boundaries of what a bot could be uh, or what a software system can be. And um, this one project, Big Data Pawn Shop by Sam Levine, Adam Harvey, and Surya Matu, um, kind of really exemplifies this idea of multiplicity because they took as a component um, all, all these, um, uh, this catalog from the NSA that had been leaked uh, by Snowden, and it was a catalog of spyware objects and kind of um, used that as the design for, for a number of things that you could buy on this marketplace called Zazzle. And Zazzle is a marketplace in which you can buy mugs and t-shirts and pillowcases and all these uh, kind of strange objects. Uh, and, and then they just kind of managed to find ways of, of kind of contaminating that marketplace with all these um, NSA files. Um, and so we sort of recreated that in this space as this, as this kind of gift shop with those objects that we bought from, from their system. For instance, tote bags with the uh, spyware product, tote ghostly. Um, and then I guess this idea of entanglement was kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm saying this almost kind of retrospectively. I can now reanalyze my own show through this lens. Uh, Bot Art School by Jeff Thompson um, was, was an art school in which you would um, be given these kind of machine generated instructions on what to draw and and people would come in and sort of uh, draw pictures in response to these generated briefs. And then we had our own sort of bot farm uh, within the exhibition space uh, using this, <clears throat> this framework called Cheap Bots Done Quick by George Buckingham. And so there was like, 
inst instead of coming to see bots, people are sort of there sort of making bots and opening their own Twitter profiles. Um, and in terms of exploring figuration, I mean, we really had everything from, uh, so this is magic realism bots, which manifested as this sort of uh, ephemeral sort of floating um, a frame above a mantelpiece uh, and it's very much it generates these kind of small magic realist stories uh, but we also had this this kind of animatronic by an artist called Shardcore which is called Mammon and so it's a very different way of of figuring and characterizing a bot using kind of a, a physical sort of statue and it also made a great thing to have at the entrance um, so out of bots was kind of a small curatorial exercise in trying to identify different practices that are really kind of pushing the boundaries of of how you can kind of conceive of what a what a bot is. And so some of my own work, novice art blogger, is a bot uh, inspired primarily by the technology that was coming out. There's this kind of new technology in 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 recognizing images and generating captions for images. Um, and it was very much trained solely on photographs. And I was kind of more curious about the captions that were really wrong, that were just not quite naming what was in the picture. And it worked, and to sort of confuse it, it worked very well with contemporary art, especially abstract art, because it really pushed the software to try and see things and use its limited vocabulary almost as a way of um, creating metaphors for what it was uh, recognizing in those pictures. So my, this is a poor diagram of my kind of computer architecture, which was constantly scraping images from the Tate's archive, running it through this, this software, then outputting it to its own blog on Tumblr. And then it was sort of generating blog posts like this, where um, this picture is commented, there is a lot of elephants in the river, but also there is a lot of elephants in the river. It is similar to sandy area with an elephant made from sand. Oh, this piece, Stefan the Conquistador, uh, it generated a close-up view of a pizza with one look at it, or it is depicting a pizza that is ready to, to bite of a large bowl. I'm reminded of a pizza decorated to look like an angry bird. Um, and I, I think in, in upon reflection, what really works with Novice Art Blogger is that instead of creating, uh, using a figuration that tried to frame it as intelligent or smart, I was kind of framing it as in being actually quite crude and not very smart at all. And so it kind of was received in a very different light as this charmingly honest, uh, you know, very um, decoding the over-articulated I love you Novice Art Blogger. There was this kind of strange fan base emerge re really quickly that kind of, that I, I guess just read this technology in a very different way because it was figured very differently. There was this characterization that um, kind of almost ridiculed machine learning and, and computer vision. Uh, in terms of entanglements, uh, I've kind of increasingly be been interested in projects where I can kind of aggregate other people's uh, user-generated content, especially 3D objects, because obviously my background is is making sort of 3D prints. So, so this one only takes two slides uh, to explain. I, I went through um, communities such as 12 3D app, and then I sort of downloaded every sort of Mickey that I could find and just created this one piece called Every Mickey. Um, Moving on, Shiv Integer is another bot that I made uh, in collaboration with Julian Desoif. And this one generates these mashups of other people's objects on this site called Thingiverse. Uh, so Thingiverse is this, this platform um, and that, that, that is there to um, I guess, bring together or enact a community of individuals that have home 3D printers and want to share their files with each other. Uh, so the whole thing uses an underlying um, licensing system called uh, Creative, um, Creative Commons. Thank you. I was going to say 
creative applications. <laughs> uh, so Creative Commons system allows, um, kind of creates a legal framework for people to sort of download other people's objects, remix them, and they can kind of decide um, how much freedom to give an object, whether uh, anyone can use it, whether it could be used as long as it's shared equally, or whether it's used for non-commercial reasons. And so the bot was really sort of, in a way, uh, utilizing this as its framework uh, and its sort of rule base on, on which to, to, to gather objects and which to join objects together. Uh, so this, this is kind of a run through of how it works. This is me imitating the bot by hand, but essentially it's putting in search terms that it will bring up objects. It will start, it, it, it kind of works without an API. It actually automates the browser because uh, Thingiverse didn't have um, an API. Uh, so we automated the browser and we automated the clicking on, on the different parts of the website. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead here. Um, and anyway, it sort of generated a, a huge number of pieces. I think we had it running for about two years. Um, and also it sort of generates these, these titles for the objects as well, kind of creating a word salad based on the input objects. So this is vertical pyramid on a dip chip. This is attachable symbols retraction model. This is case with a sad living. This is robo frog containing a base. Uh, and so all these authors would have been notified automatically by the system that their objects had been remixed. And it's interesting how the, 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 this kind of forced entanglement generated a lot of uh, angered responses, some of them quite humorous, like this is the best RoboFrob containing a base that I've ever seen. But then within that same conversation, you're probably one of those morons who think Jackson Pollock was a genius. I really hate it when I'm searching for something real and end up with results cluttered with this kind of crap. Don't kid yourself. And someone else responded, collapse shit with shit will never make poetry of art. Um, we had this one really good uh, quote by Shakespeare, uh, which had this whole analysis saying, well, I guess, of course, I guess that their comments are part of the art as well. Uh, and we really sort of honed into the comments because it was generated so many comments. Uh, we had one user called Bright Lights who took it upon himself to generate short stories for all these objects. Uh, so every time we released a new object, it created a whole like mini explanation of what that object was. Uh, and it was usually about robot overlords. So it kind of like, again, it's just that, that it's, it's almost like we couldn't get away from that story. And even like to this day, like, Years later, I'm still getting emails, and I just don't understand why now, because the bot's not even running, uh, but it's somehow so embedded itself in the whole software architecture of Thingiverse that it's almost polluted all the search results. Uh, so I'm forever going to be hated for this project. Um, and then the exhibition of this, again, a bit like what you were talking about, the documentation becomes another component of the project itself. Uh, and I imagined... Uh, a kind of an architectural display that would uh, kind of conceptually be possible to expand. So there was just like, the idea was that we'd have this, this tunnel and, and every time I'd show it, the tunnel would get a bit longer and I'd be able to put more of these objects in, inside it. Obviously I had like these kind of financial limitations. I couldn't 3D print all the objects, um, but it was really great 3D printing these because I could kind of, uh, I guess on one hand, there was, there was kind of uh, a lot of the arguments against this bot was that these were non-3D printable objects. So it was a really good challenge to actually 3D print them to high standards. And I wanted to sort of display them so they looked exactly like the sort of generated renders, uh, which meant having to sort of like redesign the whole display framework for the object rather than the other way around. Um, and so they're all sort of suspended. Um, in place, uh, but also this th this this whole process of documentation meant that, uh, for instance, here the caption has all the uh, the authors for each object. So I could kind of we could remove ourselves from the authorship of those objects and talk about more about all those kind of entangled authors um, and all their comments. We, we we turned into their these kind of like posters that we put up all around the gallery space. Um, 
So there's like, you know, comments like, what is this and why? And uh, are you okay? And this is spam. Or how does this model have anything to do with this title? Um, so the comments really became part of that documentation. And also we made this kind of ending credits, um, which was incredible. We, we had to computer generate the ending credits that credited all the authors. And there's so many entangled authors that it took two hours to watch the ending credits. Um, so how much time do I have? Sorry. I've lost track. I'm good. Okay. The boss says I'm good. Uh, so this is another project that I kind of abandoned. I can't wait to come back to. It's called All Eyes. Um, so All Eyes has kind of become relevant again because it turns out that a lot of um, machine learning systems now are being trained on images that have been scraped on Flickr. And, and back when I made this in 2012, I was really, I, I couldn't believe how open Flickr was about their users' data. You could just scrape anything. Uh, so instead of being really crude and sort of downloading everyone's pictures, I was just downloading their eyes. I was using computer vision to recognize the eyes and creating a data set of all these eyes scraped from Flickr. And so somewhere on my hard drive, I've got like thousands and thousands of eyes. Um, and it's interesting seeing it kind of pick up all the um, false positives as well. So yeah, this is was recently in the news, facial recognition's dirty little secret, millions of online photos scraped without consent. Uh, I guess that's me as well. Uh, <clears throat> at least I feel like with the eyes, I, I, I kind of, well, yeah, I, I probably cross over into um, uh, uncharted territory in terms of copyright over people's eyes. Um, but I, I, I'm just bringing up this project uh, to, you, to you as an audience, more so because I'm excited again by this project and sort of, uh, again, now that I have this data set of machine learning has is, is evolved into, to, in, in, into a place and time where we're using all these images from uh, open so social media uh, systems from, from not even very, very long ago, it's almost like that, that sort of digital footprint is being recycled now for machine learning. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite eyes. Um, and then I'll just end with another new project, which is something that's kind of work in progress. And I really thought I'd have it finished by now, but Apple have been very difficult in letting me releasing this on their app store. Uh, it's a project called Echo Youth. And it came about because at Somerset House, where I'm based, they asked me to generate a project. It's one of these impossible briefs where they wanted me to create a project for the Charlie Brown show, uh, which has just finished. Uh, that somehow would involve um, creating workshops with children that would manifest as a piece in, 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 in the exhibition, which is actually quite a, a tough thing to, to get right. Um, but I was speculating about how potentially, so this is a year ago, spe speculating about how potentially uh, the, 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 the sort of future climate change movements would come from young people, that young people would be going out and, and campaigning for, uh, for a better future. And obviously, strangely, that's become true over the course of this project uh, with the um, climate youth campaigns. Uh, so, see, so these are some of these sort of uh, pieces made uh, during the workshop. And I really wasn't giving uh, the students much to go on. The young people were coming up with these slogans all by themselves, like no plastic will be fantastic. Uh, some of them get really into it, stop pollution. And the idea was to then feed this into um, an app uh, where you could then stage these, um, st stage these, these kind of uh, uh, climate change uh, demos in, in augmented reality. So you could kind of take it to places where you wouldn't normally be able to take it. Uh, I guess because it's a work in progress, these are slightly jittery videos. Um, this is a longer video. This is actually the video that was running at Somerset House. And, and so this is kind of an early version of the app with some of the early um, placards that were made. But it, it, it was kind of me trying to find 
it's interesting because it pushed me to go to sites in which the signs sort of made sense. So I was going to places like 10 Downing Street, but also to a very green street, to part of the Thames. Um, and it's interesting now that there is so many placards being made by young people out there, it's becoming a project in which I, I could plausibly approach these, these activists and start documenting their movements. So it really becomes an echo of, of some of their work that they've made for, for real life uh, activism. And then sort of being able to make an app that people can use to sort of reconstruct um, those protests in virtual space uh, or in this kind of mixed reality space and take it to places like the United Nations or whatever uh, to sort of reenact and, and recapture those moments and, and generate uh, new, new occurrences, uh, new contexts for, for this type of climate activism. And I think I'll end it there. That's great. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.